we're talking there about a future that we truly cannot predict in detail. There's an irreducible uncertainty, just in the same sense that a cockroach will have a hard time predicting who's going to win World War II. Like, I, I mean, we're, once you get AIs that are massively smarter than we are, on a rational basis, we're in a domain where we're not going to be able to predict what happens. And what I see is, in Asia, where I've lived for eight years, the predominant feeling and assumption is that AIs will be friends of humans and will help, will help humans and everything will come out well. Whereas in the US, the prevailing vibe has often been more paranoid, like, oh, the AIs are going to kill everyone, they're going to be the Terminator, they're going to take all our jobs and we'll be left rummaging in the garbage or something. And I don't think this has to do with differing, like, rational extrapolations of technology to the future. It's just different emotional mindsets, because when you're dealing with the radical unknown, the most convenient thing is just to bring to it whatever your emotional, emotional bias is, whether it's cooperative in, as in Asia or paranoid and adversarial as, as in much of the US, right? And okay. there's an irreducible uncertainty there. You can find that exciting. You can find it frightening. You can, you can find it both. It's still going to be irreducibly uncertain. And I mean, Nick Bostrom here in, in the UK at Oxford, He's been very vocal that superintelligence is potentially dangerous, and it is. But the thing is, Nick, who I've known a long time, I have a lot of respect for him, but he, he has a way to make it sound like superintelligence is probably going to kill everybody. But, I mean, we don't know that. If you read his book, Superintelligence, all he really argues for is that that's possible. Like, we can't rule out the possibility that the superintelligence will just turn us all into extra hard drive space or something, right? And right. you can't rule it out. So there's, there's a certain irreducible uncertainty. We could decide, okay, well, let's just stop developing all this advanced tech until we somehow come up with a theory that will let us reduce this uncertainty. I personally am guessing that will never happen. Like you could, even if we pause development of advanced technology for 10,000 years, I don't think something with an IQ of 200 is going to be able to predict what happens when you create something with an IQ of 200,000. I think that there's an information theory problem there. But the other thing is, if the US and UK decided to pause development of AI technology, China certainly isn't going to, right? right. If China did, Vladimir Putin certainly isn't going to. He, he's on record saying whoever solves AI first will be the most powerful in the world. Do you agree? What? Yeah. And, and, I think and this is happening, whether it's, it's 10 years now. or 50 years. So, that, so the, yeah, that, that's the thing. So then the, the thing that we really should be worrying about, not so much the irreducibly uncertain phase when there are super AIs. I mean, we can think about that and how to bias things in a positive direction. But what happens in, in the transition period? Like, let's suppose my good friend Ray Kurzweil is correct, that 2029, we get AIs as smart as people. By 2045, we have AIs boundlessly more intelligent than, than, than people. Suppose that vague timeline is sort of correct, right? What, what happens in the, in the interim, right? Like, how, how does that affect industry? How does it affect our economy? How does that affect our lives? Because my, my best guess is whatever happens with the super intelligence, its mind state will be conditioned by the earlier AIs that we've created that grow into that super intelligence. Does everyone share that opinion? No. So, okay. so, some people think that super intelligence is just a whole other different thing, right? Because like part of me thinks that 10,000 years from now, the super intelligence will just do whatever it wants to do, even if then... Well, it may 10,000 years from now, but okay. that's, that's, the worry is more the transition, right? So okay. Im imagine, for, imagine like the transition from hunter-gatherer to agriculture, or the transition from not having language to having language, right? Now, of course, the first people to invent language, those cavemen could not foresee differential calculus, Shakespeare, and the internet, right? And programming languages, whatever, right? Yeah. Of course, they couldn't foresee those further developments. What they could maybe do is smooth the transition for their children and, and grandchildren, right? And so that, that's really what we're talking about here. When you, of course, the superintelligence will go in directions 
we can't comprehend and we can't foresee. For that matter, it may contact alien life that's like humming all around us, embedded in the vibrations of subatomic particles that we're too stupid to detect. You have no idea what's going to happen. Right. On the other hand, that doesn't mean it's irrelevant to think about like, okay, I, I mean, I have four children and one granddaughter. I don't want them to die or be reprocessed into like fuel for the superintelligence or something. I, I want them to be able to grow up and, and flourish and, and take advantage of, of new technologies that AIs help people develop, right? So it's, it's still meaningful to think about how to smooth out the transition to the, to the radical unknown. Okay. And I think it's a plausible hypothesis that the initial value system of a superintelligence may be conditioned by the value systems of the earlier stage AIs that, that we create. And okay. then toward that end, we can think about what is AI mostly being used for on the planet Earth right now? I mean, it's selling, spying, killing, and gambling, basically, right? It's, I mean, that advertising, surveillance, military, and then mark, stock market trading and so on. So if selling, spying, killing, and gambling are the primary goals and values in the mind of the first superintelligence, I mean, is it very likely we're going to have, you know, a benevolent transition period? Or should we be, as well as working on general intelligence research, which I've been doing for decades, should, be, should we be working on making sure that early stage general intelligences are, are doing things like, you know, education, child care, elder care, scientific research, mental health counseling, you know, decision support for, go for governments. Like, we want the early stage general intelligences to be doing benevolent things in cooperation with a broad swath of humanity so that the mind state of the first superintelligence is positive and, and benevolent rather than the first superintelligence being preoccupied with spying on people and selling them crap they don't need. <laughs>